what's up you guys this is rob from the gay guy plays and today on return fire we talk about exilus mods and arcwing armor and extended duration void runs go over which order i'd pick up my pallets and do a bit of digging with the stratovar now let's start a bit light with nafwal misconi's god i always butcher these ones Question on the previous episode of Return Fire, we all know that only aura mods have benefit in Arcwing, but does Coaction Drift also have an effect? This opened up my curiosity because of the fact that if Coaction works, then the rest of the Drift mods should work as well, and guess what? Coaction definitely works, so keep that in mind when you're modding for Arcwing. Now, Ethan Cantrell posted up a literal paragraph on the last episode, but surprisingly, it wasn't one of those pointless shitty internet ones. So hold on to your horses. So Ethan asks, I have a question regarding extended duration void runs and enemy armor. With the group of people that I play with, it has become practically impossible to get a full team running corrosive projection for the full armor reduction for extended survival runs. It ends up just being me and one other person at the most, and I'm interested in your opinions on bypassing armor without a full corrosive projection team. I've tried various things from Ash with the augment for his first, Banshee with the augment for her first, or even sacrificing my own killing contribution to run weapons with a 100% status build for corrosive to try to melt off enemy armor so that my teammates can take the targets down. But even at these measures, it's still becoming overly difficult to keep up a KPM, which for those of you who don't know means kills per minute, high enough to sustain a suitable amount of life support unless someone is running a necros and even then that falls off for us around an hour and a half in. The problem the problem is even worse whenever I'm running the mission solo, as I've gotten to the point where after an hour in, the only chance that I have of keeping any kind of KPM is making sure that I'm running a frame that can open enemies up for finishers, and relying solely on that. So I ask, what would you suggest trying or changing in order to effectively negate slash bypass endgame armor scaling when a 4 corrosive projection team is not an option? Alrighty, so here is the sad reality for me. Aside from swapping over to the Void Derelict, there's nothing you're really going to be able to do to avoid the issue of armor if you want to stay in the Void. The fact is, armor scaling is kind of insane at higher levels, and without something to completely clear it out, your time to kill on an enemy increases so massively that mission types like survival are almost out of the question without it. And even on things like defense and interception, even if you're able to keep enemy waves under control, consistently running low on ammo will be a major hurdle to face. Now, you can't extend your effectiveness by wrangling up as many corrosive projection users as you can and put together a strong team comp consisting of debuffers like Sarah and Banshee or Nova, but you said it yourself, there's only so far that you can go with that. So aside from blatantly using exploits to go 7 hours in a mission, there are really no other avenues other than making lots and lots of friends. Competent friends specifically. Regardless, it sounds like you're doing everything right, it's just that the game's mechanics will only allow you to bend the rules so far until until you need to skedaddle for extraction. Sorry I couldn't be of more help, but that's kind of the reality of it. Moving along to something that I can actually help with, the unstable thinker asks, I get that it's down to personal opinion, but lots of people are totally lost on what palette they should get after they've got one of the classics and maybe the Tenno slash smoke. So personally, I'd start with a classic as it gets you some of the basics, both muted and some fairly eye-catching tones. Then I'd move on to the Tenno palette. Yes, it's a bit of a clusterfuck, but it's got a multitude of grays and off-whites that I still use a lot to this day, as well as some other awesome shades scattered throughout. After that, for me, I'd have to go with the Storm palette. It's got some really, really rich tones and my rose gold. Lastly, there is a three-way tie between Dojo, Orokin, and Grenier palettes. Just pick whatever makes it feel the most moist. I'll probably end up doing a full-length video on this eventually, but this is definitely the long and the short of it. Now, the next one is going to run a bit long, as the Stradivar was definitely a big talking point recently. So, let's start off with this little sass monster of a comment from Troll of Reason on my Stradivar video. Wait, 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 you got excited by a selector switch on a weapon? You got excited by a feature that should by default be on every single automatic in game already? Oh, sweetie, oh, boo bear, oh, sugar child, we should go out because I could probably get you back to my place by jingling some keys. Not that you wouldn't be physically and emotionally rewarded for being such a cheap date. You totally would. But seriously, not everyone is amazing like I am. Maybe if instead of a lackluster crit change increase, it fired off an exploding bolt projectile semi-auto or switched over to a flamethrower, and then the comment devolves into some shit that doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm cutting it off right there, but you can pause it and try to make sense for it for yourself. Okay, there are a few things that need to be addressed. First off, no, it's not a feature that should by default be on every single automatic in-game. 
because not every single automatic in game would benefit from it. There are some weapons whose identities are built on their insane fire rates, like the Gricotta or the Gorgon who would gain nothing from having a semi-automatic mode. Much like my issue with the Stradivar, it's a pointless mechanic unless it drastically changes the way a weapon plays but still manages to keep it effective. Which brings me to your second point, fuck yeah I would totally love a flamethrower attachment or an explosive bolt semi-auto, however that is not what we have on offer. You don't go to a Mexican restaurant and ask for a motherfucking bento box. You can ask for more sour cream, you can ask to have your guac on the side, but you gotta stay within the menu, boo. And lastly, I may be a cheap date when it comes to liquor, but don't get it twisted. My body is a temple, and only those willing to devote the rest of their lives to worship can get it in. I mean, get in. Anyway, back to the subject of the Stradivar, Patrick has a much better outlook on the weapon and says, we just got another candidate to get prime. And you know what, I could not agree more, stats can be adjusted and this thing can be made gorgeous as fuck and I would not be opposed to this getting touched by the Roken whatsoever. See the thing is, to me DE was actually very close to making this interesting. Maybe having a base fire rate of 15 and a base critical chance of 20, because if we apply the same rules to it, swapping the semi-auto would bring it to a fire rate of 7.5 and a crit chance of 40. And just that slight adjustment in stats would heavily differentiate the way it plays with mods equipped. So whether they do that to its base or tune it up for the prime, I'd definitely be happy with something like that. Alrighty, that about does it for this episode of Return Fire, however I do have one question for you. Did you prefer this episode with the music or last episode with no music? Let me know and if you have any more Warframe related questions or have a suggestion for the format, be sure to leave those in the comments below as I will be keeping my eyes out. And until then, love somebody, hurt nobody, and touch your body. I'll see you guys on the next episode. Bye!